Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation. In this episode, we speak with an old friend of mine from my days in Shanghai, Joseph Constanti. Joseph is a seasoned veteran of the startup scene in China, having created the first indoor mini golf facility in China, the most back shoe in the footwear category on Kickstarter, two years in a row, co-founded Next Step Studio that now focuses on food tech and is now the director of international at New Technologies, the largest smart scooter company in the world. We talk about the early days of being an entrepreneur in China, how he was so successful on Kickstarter, best practices for starting up in China, which countries are difficult for New to penetrate and why, and what the future holds for urban mobility. Enjoy. I think as more mobility companies begin to realize their their place in the world and not just focus in on the Chinese market. But in fact, there's a lot of interesting opportunities overseas like we have recognized to help transform the way people move around Paris um, or they how they move around Buenos Aires is, you know, an opportunity to develop new, better services and products, whether that's an electric moped, an electric car, an autonomous vehicle, you know, a vertical takeoff and landing type of vehicle. You know, these Chinese companies definitely have an opportunity to take advantage of their scale. And at the same time, mobility companies in the United States, in Europe, South America and elsewhere have the opportunity to get a crash course lesson by seeing in real time how urban mobility is transforming and taking some of those best practices and taking them into their own marketplaces and developing it specific to the needs of their domestic markets. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia-Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally minded brand should ignore, but entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. Times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early stage tech companies enter the Asia Pacific market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley, and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Joseph, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on today. Hey, thanks for having me, Todd. Okay, a quick introduction uh, to yourself, and uh, do tell about uh, your time in China, how you ended up there, and the things that you were doing there. Wow, uh, that's 20, 21 years uh, end to end now. Where to get started? No, I, you know, China has been an incredible experience. I ended up there by accident in, in 2000 in university, to be really honest with you. And um, when I saw what was happening there back in 2000 in Beijing, I realized that there was a lot of potential in the country, in the people, in the marketplaces. And and as soon as I got back to the United States, uh, right after that study abroad, I, re- I really made a kind of a, a firm stance that I wanted to get back into China and into Asia to be a part of kind of the the rising economy, the rising kind of change that was happening there. And basically in 2003, moved to Taiwan, uh, studied some Mandarin. 2000, late 2004 and 2005, I moved to Shanghai, uh, where I helped to start a company called Tangential Consulting, which in its time wasn't really uh, called a, a startup studio, but we used it um, in very much as a startup studio. We started a, a miniature golf course, the first in China through it. Uh, we started a basically a, an app-based learning uh, technology as well for university students globally. Before there was an iPhone, uh, that was a nightmare, uh, having to design for hundreds, probably 100 to 200 handsets at the time in J2ME, very interesting times. Those companies ended up uh, not going in the direction that we wanted it to. And um, shortly after, we started a little thing called Next Step, which was uh, an organization designed to bring together entrepreneurs in Shanghai and across China. And that that morphed into something much larger, into like a directory and a handful of other things. And actually, now today, I no longer run it, uh, haven't run it in a long time on a day-to-day basis, but it's run by one of the co-founders. His name's Gregory Prudhomme, and it, it acts as a, as a startup studio primarily focused on kind of the intersection of, of food and technology. Um, they have some really interesting um, startups that have been running through there. And some startups that they they, they built themselves um, from scratch, but you know that leads me into like the 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 2010s and uh, where I happened to start a a group buying website, raised a couple million bucks, 
lost a couple million bucks. You know, we were what we were doing was not a group on copycat, but uh, more or less a, a middle a middleman to all the group, the 5,000 group on websites at the time. Uh, we were kind of transacting, uh, brokering the deals between the, the service providers and the um, and the websites, the Wu Tuans of the day, uh, the May Tuans of the day. Uh, we were we were supplying May Tuan at one point in time. A little kind of crazy to think about now. That ended up turning into kind of a back end software play uh, that the other co-founders continue to take on to to this day. Basically, it, it's a social media management platform for different types of companies globally. Looking at looking at China, then created a shoe company. When I got real bored. That shoe company we launched on Kickstarter. We were probably we were selling the best on Kickstarter at the time for footwear and apparel. A couple of years into that, uh, one of my co-founders, his name's Token Who, just after we raised money, he decided that he wanted to leave the shoe company. So we lost a designer, uh, but he went on to go create a company called Xiaonyo uh, New Technologies, uh, which is a uh, the largest now. It's now now the largest smart electric mobility company in the world, um, and I happen to run international for that company. I left the shoe company shortly after he left, and uh, basically since the early 2016, a little over five years now, have been uh, helping him and and that team um, move move people around the world. And we sell we sell electric mopeds, and bikes, and and scooters in more than 50 countries uh, at this point. So it's been a it's been a ride to say the least. I love that you brought that bag with a pun too. Uh, it's been quite the ride. Accidental, uh, completely accidental. So now I'm going to dip into a, a little more familiarity. Um, this is yeah. not our first podcast together. Um, no, it's not. We, uh, we did one back, uh, before you joined you and, uh, yes. Yes. uh you were, I can't believe it's been that long. I know, I know. It ha- it's been a long time, and a lot of things have happened since then. And then you look back, mm-hmm. thinking, I mean, I've I've transitioned all the way out of China through Silicon Valley, and then now back up to Canada. So, yeah, you're living a mountains. lot of stuff has happened. Now, now I'm in the in the Rocky Mountains, hiding from everybody. Um, so you uh, let's let's go back, and I want to pick this apart a little bit, one by one. Uh, you it. went to Beta, right? Yep. Um, what was that like? Oh, that was crazy. Two thousand, and there in the summer. First, it was the first time I ever left America. So I was this 20 year old kid, never left America. I showed up at Beida. Beijing was just wild. It was so cool back then. It was, there were still, there were already a lot of cars and the development was already happening. It was long in the process already, but it was just so raw at that point. And, and genuinely speaking, like I feel like people were a lot happier in Beijing back in 2000. Like you go out to the bars, the restaurants, the clubs, like there was genuine smiles on their face. Maybe it was because there was no mobile phones. No one was wasting their time, like chit chatting or, or Weibo-ing or WeChatting each other. But yeah, it was um, one of those experiences where, you know, you go into every store and there's, you know, it's the year 2000 and there's no, you know, POS machine to swipe your, your you know, your credit card, or your ATM. You're just like, and there's no ATM machines except for like one every like 15 kilometers or something. And you're thinking like, wow, this place has a long way to go, but they're already quite far along. And it was just the, kind of those experiences that kept happening over and over again when I was there just for a short period of time in the summer of 2000. But, you know, it was those short I don't know, 30, 40 days that, uh, I realized that there was a lot of potential um, in the country. Real quick, with the role that you have now, you you travel all over the world. Could I ask, do yep. you see another place in the world that you could compare and say, yeah, this place now reminds me of what it was like Beijing you know, 2000, just that kind of raw, suddenly maybe hitting their economical stride and everybody's happy and things are moving and it's a great place. It's really up and coming. Great question. Let me take a step back on that question really quickly. I actually was very interested in Asia prior to going to China. I actually wanted to go to Vietnam. Um, I was particularly interested in Southeast Asia and studying all the governments dating going back, you know, one or two centuries and was fascinated by the region, but ended up in China because there was no study abroad programs in Southeast Asia that were going to work out for me in the year 2000. So they're like, do you want to go to China? It's free. I said, sure. Anyway, so your question asked, where is that? What's happening in the world right now? That's any bit like China. And I think anywhere you drop into in Southeast Asia at this moment in time, if, if it's a big metropolitan area, you know, whether that's, you know, Ho Chi Minh City in, in South Vietnam or Jakarta, um, in Indo or, or Bangkok, you get that sense. Now, culturally, 
they are a bit different than China. Uh, and, and so it, it will, their development will not copy what China has done over the past 20 years, at least since I've been in China. But I think it will take a kind of a mixed path forward and that will kind of mix a little bit of Chinese assistance and growth, uh, European and American assistance and growth, and then homegrown growth developed, you know, by the Thai, the Vietnamese, the Indonesians themselves. Um, so it'll, it'll be interesting to, to see where, where they go. But the energy in those cities, especially like Jakarta and Bangkok, uh, where I can speak, I, I've been to quite often over the past couple of years, uh, less so than, than Vietnam. Just fascinating it, just to see what's happening there right now. And, and let me take that one step further as well. It's not raw like China was in 2000, but I think America is, not because I'm American, is this overlooked place now just because the developing world is, is sexier and cooler. But damn, there's a lot happening in the United States right now. And, and damn, is there a lot of talent that still lives there and is, and is still migrating there every single year, despite the fact what's happened over the past five to 10 years in the country. People still want to go there, build businesses, live in America. And, and to say the American dream, it's a, it's a bit cliche, but they want to go experience that and help be a part of that. So of all the places that I think are very interesting globally right now, America. Put the U.S. on the list. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. I know that when I traveled in Southeast Asia for a bit, uh, you know, I have vacations in Vietnam and, and Thailand, got married in Indonesia, the whole thing. I was actually shocked, surprised and shocked at the reach of influence that China had even throughout Southeast Asia. I had no idea how just uh, integrated uh, China and the Chinese were uh, just through kind of um, a lot of immigration from China heading south. Um, yeah. Did you ever find that? Were you ever surprised by that or shocked by that? Never shocked or surprised by it. You know, you read the stories and when you're there, I mean, the obvious ones like Malaysia and Singapore make a lot of sense, right? That's just been kind of a, a migration trail for better part of a century and a half. But uh, the especially interesting one is Indonesia. Uh, and there's a lot of in, uh, Chinese companies very deeply rooted in, in Indonesia and been there for 20, 30, 40 years um, in, in very diverse types of industries, everything from manufacturing to, to dairy, you, you name it, they have a, a foothold there. So I think people need to really realize the, the scope of, of China's reach, Chinese entrepreneurs and businesses reach throughout um, the Southeast Asian region. It's pretty broad. Yeah, we've talked about your dalliance with mini golf, and and I always thought mini golf would be great, and I I never really saw it ever take off. I never saw it even up until when I left in 2016. Just real quick, your thoughts on uh, um why you came up with uh, an idea to do mini golf, and then uh, what did you do, and how did it turn out? So we came up with the idea because a handful of us, but it was spurred on by the fact that golf. Is, is a prestige sport and, and Chinese love to put their children into prestige sports or prestige activities, learning to play the piano, learning to play the violin. Long story short is I learned how to play golf on like a putt-putt course and, and on a, like a, a par three type of course when I was a kid. And the problem was in, in China in the early 2000s, the only place you could you get any kind of tea time is on a very expensive private course. There was no public courses. There was no par threes. There was no putt-putts. So I said, well, why not give kids and their families an opportunity to, to learn how to play golf at the very basic level and then give them an introductory to it so everyone could play? Um, and so that was that was kind of the thesis. You know, We put it in the largest mall in Shanghai indoors because we know Chinese don't like to be outside, especially in the heat of summer. You, you know, it, it was a... Uh, a jungle themed miniature golf. You know, it, we were, we had it open, you know, from start to finish about two years. And the real, the, the, the issue that we had with it was really straightforward is in America is it's family event, you know, mom, dad, and a couple of kids and your friends came all together. Unfortunately in, in China, the, the parents didn't really take to the, um, to the sport with their child and they just kind of threw their kids uh, at our facility and left to go shopping. So we think putting it in the shop and when I look back now, putting it in the shopping center probably was not the best idea. We probably should have put it in the middle of nowhere so that they just had to stick with the kids. And so we, we lost a lot of potential uh, revenue to say the least. So make it a family destination. Yeah. It was not a family destination. It was more like a, it became like a daycare for daycare. my staff. <laughs> yeah. But it was fun. Really fun. Played a lot of golf, oh, Played a lot yeah. of golf balls. Yeah. Yeah. How did you close things down at the very, very end? 
I always tell the story. It was, it was Valentine's Day. And uh, me and, and a couple of the other co-founders, a couple of them are back in America now. We cleared the uh, the refrigerator of all its Corona and everything else that was in that. And we just sat there all night until they shut the power down on us. And, and, that, and then we called it quits. That's kind of how we ended yeah. it. Yeah. Kind of funny. I look back on it. <laughs> That's why I was asking. It's very vivid. I knew you, that. Know, you know how there's certain moments in your life that are very vivid? Yeah. Drinking Coronas inside a dark mall uh, in in a, in a miniature golf course. You, you just don't forget yep. that type of stuff. You just don't. No kidding. You've been a, a pretty awesome entrepreneur. Awesome is a good way to describe it. I, I would say not so you, you know financially uh, successful, but I mean, right. the, what we built were, were a lot of fun and, and productive. A lot and, of and cool worthwhile. things. Yeah, a lot of yeah. cool things. And, you know, just from, you know, the mini golf and, uh, you know, waterproof paper shoes. And we'll talk about it in a sec in, in, in you know, <laughs> next step in doing co-working. You've, you've done all this kind of stuff. Yeah. And so you understand entrepreneurship. And as you're talking about the mini golf and you're talking about how parents more kind of come and, and it wasn't something that they would do. And maybe it was because it wasn't something that they had any interest in or any desire to learn something new. Mm-hmm. And I'm angling this around to talk a little bit about what the state of entrepreneurship was, which you understood through um, the next step as well. Yeah. What culturally, even in the family dynamic, mm-hmm. were your impressions and takeaways of what entrepreneurship was from 2000 to 2010 because I think in 2010 things started to go better started to take off and then by 2015 it was really starting to be accepted but the 2000 2010 era um, talk to us about what you were you know your impressions of entrepreneurship in the in the China culture was yeah I mean amongst the expats there were there were so many of us I mean, we're not talking tens of thousands of people, but there were thousands of people there coming, you know, looking for, you know, to try to build something there from scratch. Interestingly, we thought we would be able to interact entrepreneurs, business owners of all sizes in Shanghai. And in fact, we couldn't find any. I mean, there were, there were, you really couldn't find too many. Obviously, there was business owners starting their own restaurants and other small businesses like that. Um, but they're really, wasn't too many that were say in the technology space or in in any other kind of uh, recreational space that we were interested in and uh you know what we what we really learned a couple of years later when we started next step which was to bring together entrepreneurs was that these guys didn't exist because culturally it wasn't acceptable for them because their parents the guys that were our age let's say those that are like bottling hose born after 1980 or between 1975 and 1985 those individuals they needed to get a job get married, buy a house, have a kid, be financially successful, and do all that by the time they were 30, right? And, and so running a startup is like does, is not, does not compute, right? It's not a part of that equation. And so what ended up happening that we saw is like post-2010 into the teens, really what you began to see is those guys all turned 30, done fairly well in their jobs, had risen pretty quickly because there was no one ahead of them that was more qualified than them at that point in time management wasn't really that robust in China. And, and so they began to venture out onto their own. And that's really where, if you look back at it, it's really in the late two, like 2010 forward, where you begin to see all these different types of startups, in, especially in the technology space, blossom. Of course, there was Tencent. And of course, there was Tudo. And there was you know so many of these other you know, tech startups that were happening, but they were, it was not prolific in Shanghai and Beijing and Shenzhen at that time. And I think it was just a cultural, it was, like I said, a cultural thing that they needed to, you know, stick to the line uh, and, and make the family happy, which is wild to think about. Yeah, it's um, it, it's it was a pay it back, um, not really a pay it forward uh, type of uh, a cultural uh, flywheel uh, effect, I think, where, um, yeah, you know, yeah. this, this is way to even why it. they wanted more boys um, being born than, than girls, just because the way it was structured is that they needed the success from their children in order to have security for when they became too old to work. Um, who was going to take care of them didn't really have like a 401k that they were contributing to through their right. life. And right. so it was kind of their kids that they were looking to, which is where the intense pressure to just study and get a really good job started to come from it was almost a fear of their own um well-being when they got later on in life so yeah all right cool cool little dalliance there in the conversation i appreciate that joe no problem your work 
with tangential consulting. And I know we've we've covered a little bit of it. We've sprinkled some of those activities yeah. into the conversation already. Yeah. Um, if you could uh, kind of like put a bow on that um, and tie everything that's involved with tangential together for me. So tangential was put together in 2005, uh, basically before there was the idea of, of startup studios. And a couple of us really had a bunch of different ideas. One was for miniature golf. Another one was for education. Some were for F&B. And we decided to put this consulting company together because we had all actually interned at a law firm. And we said the easiest way to set up an entity in China is, is to set up a consulting firm. And then from that, you can build a, a, you know kind of an umbrella around the other projects or companies that you're building. And then if you see you want to take them further, then you can just develop them as their own independent company in China. And so the, the two main projects that came out of Tangential, one was Lucky Greens Mini Golf that was in Shanghai. And the other one was a company called, uh, we've already spoken about it, and, and the other one was called Lextex. And, and Lextex was an app that was built for university students and high school students uh, learning from textbooks in the United States, in Europe, and even in China. And, and basically, those two companies uh, were run through the tangential entity. And once we were done with those companies, then tangential really kind of ceased to exist uh, or need to exist. Uh, but it was a it was a studio before studios were a thing. We never really started too many others. And to be honest with you, we also launched Next Step through uh, Tangential as well. So three things. And Next Step is now its own studio uh, more than 14 years later. So I guess it lived Tangential in some small way lives on, despite the fact that it's a non-existing entity anymore. I'm, I'd like to ask you a little bit just about what you said on the legal side. Didn't know that you interned with a law firm, by the way. Yeah, that was um, fun. Oh, man, that was crazy. Why was it crazy? Yeah, I mean, this is like 2005. People were showing... <laughs> we, had, we had business owners from overseas like showing up and wanting to buy factories. Cash. Cash. They would go to the bank, literally pull out like many bags of cash. And I knew, like, I was with these guys, and they had several million RMB in cash for a down payment on, on like a factory. And I remember just sitting there thinking, like, this is the wild. This is 2005. Like, why are we still living in like the wild, wild west in 2005? It was those types of stories, uh, those types of experiences that uh, I was a part of. Yeah, reminds me of that book, uh, uh, Mister China by uh, like, Tim straight, Russell. straight out of Mister China. I mean, it could have been yeah. a chapter uh, that experience. When it comes to, uh, you know, with your own experience of, uh, of setting it up, the, you know, when it comes to labor laws, taxation, the corporate structure and, and foreign direct investment, um, what can you tell us a little bit? You already gave us some insight about, you know, uh, setting it up as a consulting company, mm -hmm. why that was the preferred way to go. But, uh, is there anything else that you can maybe touch on from what you learned setting up companies in China? Uh, just, uh, why you might want to call it a consulting company, how you might want to do something around, yeah, I'm going to need a bank account. Um, mm. and, um, and then even on the end of that, I know that when I was with China Accelerator, we did struggle with our American born US passport holding entrepreneurs mm. as far as trying to get them set up uh, with bank accounts in Hong Kong mm. or mm. In, oh, yeah. in China. Impossible. Impossible now. US people have um, extra levels of uh, resistance when they when they try to do that. So anything mm. in there, please, please talk to that from your experience. Yeah, well, I mean, my experience around setting up the companies themselves, you know, it's more than a decade has passed. So a lot has changed uh, mm -hmm. since I've really been setting up entities uh, in, in China. Some of them continue to run. But, you know, back then, there was a number of there was only there was a, a a limited number of companies that a foreigner could actually start up. And a consulting company was the easiest one. And it had a fairly large umbrella of what it could operate under. You know, if you were going to get into technology, let's say 10, 15 years ago, it was, it wasn't challenging. It just, there was limitations. And that's why a lot of companies ended up setting up like VIE structures um, so that they could, you know, run an internet company um, in China over a decade ago. It was, it was a bit of a challenge. Um, but, you know, more and more, you still see a lot of companies. You know, we have friends that are, you know, still there running their own companies. And a lot of them have usually operate 
two entities, one in Hong Kong and, and, and one in, in China. Uh, the Hong Kong usually acts as a, an investment mechanism uh, for overseas investors that want to put money into their company. Um, it's, a, it's a lot easier for those investors to feel safe uh, in controlling the Hong Kong entity rather than a China-based entity. Um, so that is still a very, very common structure, especially for anything web-related. Um, and even for other industries like food and beverage um, and, and the services as well, it's very, very common. Um, but as you mentioned, Todd, you know, for Americans wanting to set up um, bank accounts and entities in Hong Kong, there's a little bit, there's a couple more hoops that you have to jump through at this point. Uh, they made it especially difficult. Uh, just it, it has to do with um, American uh, reporting that they have to do, and they don't really prefer to have. Uh, Americans um, in their banking system if they don't need to. Um, so that's that's fair. Uh, I think it's, it's it's it should be that way. But you know, I think setting up a business in China, you know, you get what you pay for. It. Find a great lawyer, find a, a decent consultant that really understands your space. Uh, they're not that hard to find. Send me an email and I'll put you in touch with a couple of people uh, that, that that I think are, are good people and and they will definitely uh, put you in in touch with the the correct um, law yeah. firm or other consulting firm. There's you know there's dozens that can help you for sure mm-hmm. without you having any issue whatsoever across multiple industries. Shout out to uh, Art Dicker, a uh, good friend of China Accelerator, Benjamin Cho, who was ex Cooley and, and whatnot. I think he's with Loeb and Loeb now, past guest on the show as well. Excellent, excellent people. Uh, that's a great episode for those who want to go back and, and check that out. Uh, but yeah, thanks very much for that. I think the IRS um, and some of their abilities to, if, if you if you take on a client um, or if you open a business account where it is uh, more than 50% owned by U.S. passport holder or holders, um, the IRS has the legal ability, I think, to to somehow come in and be able to audit. Um, and I think a lot of banks just don't want to ever allow uh, the IRS in for any reason. So they make it a, extra hard for, for U.S. passport holders uh, in that regard. So keep that in mind if that's uh, something you're considering. Let's talk about new. Um, I think it's it's high time we're gonna get, get into this. Well, you have a storied past, my friend, and uh, I think all that anecdotal history of of your time in China is really um, it's really interesting, and I think it really activates the senses for those people that are listening, uh, especially if anybody has uh, experience in China. Uh, just to reminisce about the old days, you know, it's uh, it's there's nothing like it, and uh, I'm, I'm sure it'll, it'll, it'll never be 2009 experience. again in Shanghai. It'll never be 2009 again. That's for sure. No. No, it will not. Uh, I was actually in Dalian uh, mm-hmm. at that time, and and that was crazy tier two city for five years, right on the coast. Uh, mm-hmm. It was pretty awesome. Just tell us about new. Just you know, give us the tagline, give us the elevator, you know, pitch. You should just tell us briefly. You know, how do you explain to what new is? Let's just get that out of the way. The quick description. Yeah, I mean, the, the quick description is new is the the leading smart mobility company in the world. Primarily, we design and develop electric mopeds, electric bikes, electric scooters, and electric motorcycles, all using lithium-ion powered battery packs that we design. All our bikes, all our vehicles are connected. So you have a nice little app you can tap into and see where you've driven recently, see what the status of your battery is, things like that. But the best way to understand us is is we're trying to transform urban mobility. All of our our vehicles are purpose-built for city commuting. Uh, whether those are Chinese cities or European cities or Southeast Asian or Latin American or American cities, that's what we're trying to we're, we're, we're trying to help transform the urban transport landscape. And there's a lot of companies in you know in this space, both in China and and globally, right? Um, our competition is not just other motorcycle companies or electric motorcycle companies or electric bike companies. Our competition is also companies that we work with and we, we supply. So our competition is is companies like Lime, you know, who's very well known around the world, but you know, we supply them their mopeds. You know, so our, our vehicles are used in in sharing in many, many cities around the world, um, as well as owned by independent customers. And then now they're being used in, you know, the rapidly rising uh, rapid grocery business. So like get tier. Uh, uses our, our mopeds in Europe and others are beginning to use them in the Americas and Europe as well. So, you know, in a nutshell, we make pretty cool electric mopeds. Kind of think about if, if, if Vespa and Tesla had a baby, 
it would be us. That's the best way to understand what we make. Uh, if you want to visualize it with, uh, without any picture in front of you. That's how I explain it to Americans because like, they have no yeah. clue. Companies that get to number one in their space do it in a, in a number of different ways. It can be through differentiation uh, or it can be just being better at certain things and than their competition. How would you describe your company's ability to be so successful and, and, and reach that number one spot? I think it's because... I think it's because we stepped into a space before others were ready to go into it. And, and very early on when they, when, you know, when the first drafts of vehicles are being designed in 2014 and into 2015, lithium ion powered moped wasn't even really thought of. There was a handful of small little startups that were doing it, but this was the first time that, you know, serious entrepreneurs, serious investors came around and said, yeah, this is going to be a thing. Lo and behold, the Chinese customer really wanted it. And that's why it just took off in the summer of 2015, right from, right from the start. And it started with a crowdfunding sale. <laughs> so once again, uh, it goes back to kind of deep roots in crowdfunding. And, and then that's really... It tapped into a customer base that wanted like an iPhone or like the Samsung version of their mobility device. But in China, most of the, the, the electric mopeds and electric bikes at the time were, to be honest with you, pretty crappy, uh, not really well designed, uh, really poor technology. The battery technology was like old school lead acid batteries. And that was what was, had been around for the better part of a decade. You know, what most people don't know is in China, every year, every year, even right now, there's 25 million electric mopeds being sold. They call them electric bikes. So when you read the data, it says electric bikes. But trust me, it's a moped. And that is the market that we jumped into, a very saturated market already. And then we just kind of wedged ourselves in as a lithium ion smart scooter. And we very quickly began to dominate that space. And even in, so in China right now, if it's a lithium ion based scooter that's smart, we're by far and away the leader. Now, there's still many, many millions of, of lead acid battery scooters still being sold in China. And that's, that's slowly diminishing. So we came into this spot just to kind of move around the lead acid batteries. Um, and that, that's what really let us stick out. So that's the long answer to, to that question. And then overseas, uh, where we position ourselves into Europe, uh, the first kind of region that we went to outside of China is, is really to look at a market, places in Germany, which were already very, which were already very, very accustomed to EV. And then other important motorcycle markets and moped markets like Italy, Spain, and France and Netherlands were kind of our first targets. So we focused in on where it wasn't like a huge shift of, of culture to get people onto a moped. And so that's why we, we focused there. And then also we're already willing and accepting a, of an electric vehicle. And that's kind of been the very basic strategy and to allow people to see in Europe, when we went overseas in Europe, to allow people to see that companies developing products from China can develop really great stuff. And we spent the better part of the first two and a half years um, in Europe convincing people, showcasing people through, you know, ride tests, legitimate, you know, reviews by the biggest motorcycle magazines um, to showcase to people that this is, in fact, a great product that you can feel secure, rely on every day and be proud be a proud owner um, of that vehicle. And that that early homework uh, has really paid off more recently uh, in, in the fact that new is has is, is become the, the leader. Um, in electric mopeds in, in Europe at this point. Thank you for touching on um, the expansion and yep. why, you know, Europe was a kind of a, a layup or, or an, a no brainer next place to go. Yep. I wanted to ask what areas of the world are more difficult, not saying mm -hmm. they are difficult for you, but would be more difficult and maybe some understanding as to what it is culturally fundamentally distances between you know the the distance one travels is it's so far greater in one area versus another more densely probably something like that i don't need to lead you into into any answers i'm sure you know which areas of the world are a little more difficult take a little more work to penetrate and why that's a great question todd and i, I think if we were only selling mopeds then there are, there are obvious answers as to these markets are, are a huge challenge. Like mopeds in, in the United States of America or Canada, uh, it, it's just not really a thing. Uh, but surprisingly, when we put them into sharing programs in like New York City and Miami and San Francisco, they're a thing. They're super cool and people love to ride them. So it's, it's kind of a cultural, sometimes it, it's a, if it was there, easy to, to access, then people would probably be very, very comfortable with it. But we don't only make mopeds, right? We make electric bicycles now. We make electric kick scooters now. 
And what we have found is over time, it, we're still a very young company. We're, we're six years old, right? From the time we first sold our, our first moped in China. So we're developing, we're beginning to develop products for urban mobility, depending on what those regions really need, right? So in Europe right now, mopeds are in certain regions are going to continue to be a, a dominant two wheel form factor. But in other parts of Europe, you know, the two wheels is not a moped, but is in fact, maybe a bicycle, electric bicycle or electric kick scooters, which continue to sell by the hundreds of thousands of units um, across, across Europe. And the same thing in the United States, you know, electric bikes are the United, the Americans are behind the curve on electric bike adoption, but COVID-19 kind of helped them quickly pick up that space, right? You just read a couple articles, you'll, you'll see, and as well as kick scooters, right? Electric kick scooters. So that's why we've diversified our product range to be able to actually tap into the mar- the urban needs of those specific regions. If we if we were dependent on only on mopeds, then we'd be running into walls all over the world. Yeah. And when it comes to developing markets, so I didn't bring up like Southeast Asia or Latin America or Africa. I'll leave Africa out of the conversation right now because that's a very special territory for two wheels. But you know, when we look at Southeast Asia and Latin America, huge two wheel regions, absolutely huge, millions of units of, of, of petrol motorcycles and, and motorcycle and mopeds being sold every single year in Vietnam, Indonesia. Go look at the data. It's incredible the amount of units uh, on a per capita basis. The evolution of petrol to EV is going to take the next couple of years in those markets, primarily because of cost, right? Um, and, and that really comes down to finding a way to either finance the vehicles for the end user or finding other ways where the, the battery, which is the most expensive component, is, is kind of segregated from the vehicle itself and is not owned by the customer, but is, is the customer subscribes to that battery. And as we develop new technologies, I think we'll, we, we will get there as well as some of the other players that are moving into uh, the two-wheel EV space. Uh, we'll be able to more rapidly um, develop those markets once we can get it on par with uh, the cost of petrol. Then it only then the total cost of ownership is far less than petrol. Right now, total cost of ownership is pretty much on par, no matter where you go in the world, a two wheel EV versus a petrol EV. But unfortunately, customers don't understand total cost of ownership. Number one and two, total cost of ownership when you have to pay everything up front doesn't make sense for a lot of people that you know cannot afford a two thousand dollar vehicle at this point in time. That's interesting. Talking about battery subscription, like the the whole subscription model, it really interesting. Subscribing to a battery, essentially, I guess is what we're saying. Um, mm. It's a really unique take. Uh, it's got me really thinking. But I love that in your entrepreneur nature, yes. you guys, the way you approached not trying to round peg into square hole, but rather understanding what the market was there. And, you know, in the in the great words of Bruce Lee, you know, just being like water, water. accepting what was in front of you yeah. and just finding a way around it and just really kind of just taking what the market gave you and then giving it something back um, that made sense. Um, that's just really smart. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that's, and we had the technology, the understanding of the battery technology, understanding of the connectivity, the motor. These are all relatively similar components in design and manufacturing. So when you have that know-how, know-how and knowledge, and also the ecosystem that supports that, you know, in our manufacturing base, uh, just outside of Shanghai, it, it, it helps us tremendously um, at scale. Yeah. So, I, I want to touch on that. You manufacture in, in China. Um, tell us a little bit about um, what the operations are in China. How big is it? How many different departments are covered there? Um, you know, what percentage of the company is still based there? How important is it that new is, is based in China? Are there advantages or disadvantages in being based in China? The entire company is based in China. You know, there's only a handful of us that uh, that uh, live and work overseas, and and that's because the overseas side of our business is uh, we work with um, more than 40 distributors around. I think it's 40 distributors, maybe 38 uh, distributors around the world. So they represent us in their local country. So Germany has an exclusive distributor. Brazil has an exclusive distributor. Back office operations are all based out of Beijing. R and D out of Shanghai. So two separate offices. Between those two offices, uh, let's just call it about 500 people 
Uh, I don't know the number exactly, to be honest with you. It, it's constantly rising on a regular basis as we grow the R&D and, and, and other departments. And then our factory, our factory is just outside of Shanghai in a city called Changzhou. Um, and there we, we, we own our own factory assembly. But what most people have to understand is when you, when you make electric mopeds or electric bikes, you're not really, it's not like making an engine. A lot of it, it's think of it like making an iPhone where it all, all the components are coming from different suppliers, but most of those suppliers, we have done the design architecture for the battery pack, but they put the battery pack together for us. Uh, the motor is made in collaboration with Bosch or some other uh, motor maker. We, de- we design and develop all our own IoT, the BMS, the controller, someone else makes it and then we assemble it. So that's the best way to think about that. And I think our, our capacity now is at that at the two factories that we own in Changzhou, I think it's it's like 1.5 to 2 million units a year, the, the current capacity is capable of. So it's quite sizable. Um, it's, it's a very large entity there. Um, and I think in China now we have 2,000 um, mono-branded stores. Pretty, so think of it like 7-Eleven, like all the store owners are independent of, of the new company, but they, they're like, it's like 7-Eleven. Um, and then overseas, I think we have over a thousand stores, uh, multi-brand stores that sell our, our products. And we have another more than 50, I believe, yeah, 50 flagship stores in cities like Paris. We just, we're just about to open up in New York City. Honolulu is opening up soon. Amsterdam, Milan, Rome, London, Buenos Aires, Santiago, Chile, Bogota, Mexico City, you name it. If it's a capital city, we probably, or a big urban area in a, in a large country, we, we've got it. Not, we've already got it on our, on our books. And then we have, you know, like I said, a thousand stores around the world selling our products. So we've been busy and it's been, you know, it's definitely been a, a battle to, to get it to where it is today. And a lot of collaboration with global partners, right? Without those partners, you know, new uh, would, would have moved a little bit slower, but that's the beauty of this business is that there is an incredible network of down to the, the, the small dealer, all the way back up to the national distributor to us. And, and we've developed a, a very unique uh, relationship all the way down to a lot of our dealers. I have phone calls with our dealers on a fairly regular basis. And it's it's quite interesting to, to talk to guys in Spain and France and the Netherlands, and then in South America, like in Chile or in Bogota, and then back to the United States, right? So you, you see everyone is a moped dealer, a motorcycle dealer, and, and but they're all from 30, 40 different countries. It's really, it, it, it's, it's a fascinating experience. Uh, it sounds quite basic, but to be really honest with you, you begin to see kind of salt of the earth entrepreneurs, guys who really love motorcycles, like really love them. Um, and and the, that, that's one of the reasons I really enjoy working for this company is because there's people that are so passionate about motorcycles. They don't, they're not, they're not really worried about urban mobility or anything like that. They just love the machine. They love to understand it and they love to be with them. They love to help people, you know, get onto a motorcycle or a moped instead of a car. It's, it's, uh, those conversations are quite fun. You've been on the cutting edge of changing the way people get around, um, changing the face of mobility. Talk to me, if you can, a little bit about what you've seen in China, maybe some of the ripple, the, the cause and effect, because, you know, with every action comes an equal and opposite reaction sometimes uh, in some way, in some form, as much as, you know, I'm just wondering what impact has new had and if we talk about china first and then what equally interesting reactions has new been able to impact or or effect outwardly from their presence and the way that they've been able to help people uh change and the way you've changed urban mobility i think in china around urban mobility it's been over the past five to eight years there's been an incredible change happening, whether that's through companies like DD or companies like Mobike and Ofo, rapidly rising to incredible amount of uh, shared bicycles around China, to companies like New, who entered into an industry that it would had its you know had firmly rooted leaders um, in the marketplace, but entered into it in a way that we could be successful and and, and begin to lead in, in that space. And so the, the interesting part about China, I think the thing that people need to learn about China when it comes to mobility is that this is the pure density of people and, and, and the sheer number of cities that are in China make it fairly easy for mobility focused companies, automotive companies to be able to experiment very rapidly for the urban context, much more so than 
anywhere else on the planet. And that's purely by chance and by luck that there's 1.4 billion people in, in a country. And most of the, and more and more of those people are living in cities and more and more of those people need to move around. So just by default, they have to figure out new solutions to move those people around. Right. And so the beauty of it is, is that companies that are operating in China that, that have the foresight to see that what they're developing in China has application in cities around the world, whether that's the United States or Europe or, or elsewhere, they have the good fortune that they have the scale of China to be able to design, develop, iterate, and then begin to repurpose for overseas applications. And I think as more mobility companies begin to realize their, their place in the world and not just focus in on the Chinese market, but in fact, there's a lot of interesting opportunities overseas like we have recognized to help transform the way people move around Paris um, or they would, how they move around Buenos Aires is you know, an opportunity to develop new, better services and products, whether that's an electric moped, an electric car, an autonomous vehicle, you know, a vertical takeoff and landing type of vehicle. You know, these Chinese companies definitely have an opportunity to take advantage of their scale. And at the same time, mobility companies in the United States, in Europe, South America, and elsewhere have the opportunity to get a crash course lesson by seeing in real time how urban mobility is transforming and taking some of those best practices and taking them into their own marketplaces and developing it specific to the needs of their domestic markets, right? So in many ways, we all know that many years ago, and still to this day, but definitely many years ago, China would look overseas at technologies and develop for their home market while keeping out the rest. Now, the overseas companies residing never with any ambitions of coming into China can see what's happening in China. If they take a little bit of extra time and do some due diligence on what's happening in their space, whether it's mobility or any any space, they can begin to see as to kind of the rising trends that may occur in their markets and they can get out ahead of the curve, right? I mean, I don't need to get into that. I mean, this is all over the tech crunches of the world, but in mobility specifically, I think China has a very unique position due to massive density of, of human beings in hundreds of cities with more than a million people uh, that allow it to be able to very, very, very fast, uh, in, in a very, very fast manner, be able to transform how we move around cities and how we move, period. Talk to me. And, you know, the last question that I'm I'm interested in is, is generally speaking, talking about what's next for your your company and what do you see as the future for electric powered mobility in any form? I, mean, I think the, the future for us is continuing to develop in the form factors that we are really comfortable in, the two-wheel two -wheel electric, so mopeds, motorcycles, kick scooters, e-bikes, and, and developing them specific to the needs of the markets, whether it's Indonesia or, or, or France. Uh, what they need, we will develop for them. So I think that's the direction that the company will take. And then obviously in China, continuing to the growth um, that we have there and continue to move into, you know, for beyond first and second tier cities, but into third and fourth tier cities and developing that retail network, both online and offline. And when it comes to electric mobility, I mean, I think we're, we're only beginning to scratch the surface of how people will move um, around, around urban context. You know, the, the one thing I, that I, that I find quite interesting is, is that, you know, I don't think we're going to have an overnight globally. We're not going to have an overnight shift to, to EV. Um, I don't see it all happening in the next nine years by 2030. It, it's just not possible uh, because the, the, the use case of vehicles globally still require, well, at least right now with the current technologies of batteries, it does not bode well for all use cases in all global markets. Combination of the, the battery technology itself and then the cost of that technology prohibits a lot of use in non urban context. Uh, I think EV, especially two wheel EV, is best apt for the urban context. And, and so when it comes to that, I believe you know, the next types of vehicles will just be more efficient, more affordable electric two wheels. For the urban context, I think that's where you'll see the, the biggest, most rapid iteration and growth. Has COVID and I try to I'm trying to get away from bringing COVID into every darn conversation I have, right? Yeah. Um, but has COVID impacted your business or mobility in general in any way? 
Well, I mean, it, definitely in mobility in general, it has. I mean, you, again, just go read any New York Times article or TechCrunch and the slump at the beginning of COVID for all the sharing operators around the world, whether it was kick scooters or bikes or whatever, to, you know, the rapid, the rapid growth just after, you know, the peak of COVID back to sharing, to sharing vehicles. So, and then for our business, uh, we have, we have fared the, the COVID storm quite well. Um, and, and we continue to sell uh, both in China. Uh, we continue to grow our sales in both in China and overseas, uh, which is, which is a good sign. Um, and then, you know, some spaces in two wheels, Big, powerful Harley Davidson motorcycles have done exceptionally, exceptionally well during COVID, but just just past the peak of COVID, and that has a lot to do with people just like I got to get out and like I want to go ride. Um, so you know those types of uh, of, of vehicles uh, saw a tremendous spike post COVID, which is is very very interesting to see. But I think what COVID has done, obviously, is for the cities has transformed, you know, such things as basic as, as lanes being developed for bicycles. Like how crazy an idea was that? And yeah. it took, it took a global pandemic to put a bicycle lane down in most American cities. Wild that it took that to make that happen, right. To make riders feel comfortable on, on the roads that they paid with their tax dollars as well to be able to travel on safely. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the the one thing to note coming out of COVID and hopefully it sticks is, is, is that, especially in cities, is that we understand that cities were not built for cars, but were built for pedestrians to walk and move around the city at a walking pace. And so even our vehicles need to, you know, re understand drivers of our vehicles need to understand that, you know, the pace of cities is at pedestrian level and at pedestrian pace. And, you know, most of our vehicles that are sold in cities only go 45 kilometers an hour, right? And why do cars need to be able to, why do cars have, have the ability to go 50, 60, 70 kilometers an hour on, on service level streets inside, inside cities? It's, it's, it's insane to me. You know, people can still drive cars and I'm fine with that. That's, that's not a problem. But let's build safer streets for cars, for motorcycles, for e-bikes, for kick scooters, and, and of course, for the walking pedestrians and make kind of that urban context a completely pedestrian-friendly zone. And I think that's what will come out of COVID as long as we stick to the stick to the script that we're currently running on. That's my hope. That's my absolute hope. Joseph, thank you very, very much for coming on the show. It's been, a, it's been far too long since we've been able to speak uh, again. And I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you, man. It has been too long. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation. And if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jian.